I'm Norman Clayblad. I'm Susan and Elie Rose, Chief Curator at the Jewish Museum. And I'm very happy to welcome you all to the Mildred and George Weissman Lecture. At the, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. At the Jewish Museum. Um, the, the Weissmans are people I've known for a long time, and I welcome Mildred and um, a large representation of her family and friends um, to the museum, and thank her and um, the late George Weissman for making this lecture possible. Our program tonight is inspired by the remarkable recently published volume by the photographer Gay Block entitled About Love. The book's rather romantic, somewhat redemptive title is deceptive. Gay Block's work is known for its provocative look at self, at family, and at upper class Jewish society into which Gay was born. In her photographs, Gay has dealt with issues of sexuality and gender, the constrictions and contradictions of privilege, as well as the vulnerability of age at both ends of the spectrum. With Gay's unflinching glance, I could propose few better partners in conversation than the writer Daphne Merkin. In, the wor in words and photographs, they have both brought to light serious issues of gender and class, American Jewish dreams, and disappointments. As a portrait photographer, Gay Block began in 1973 with images of her own affluent Jewish community in Houston, and later expanded this to include different demographics, namely South Beach, Miami, and young girls in an upper-class Jewish camp. The latter were shown at the Jewish Museum in the mid-1990s, and I myself had the pleasure to install them. Her landmark work with writer Malka Drucker, Rescuers, Portraits of Moral Courage in the Holocaust, was both a book and a traveling exhibit, and has been seen in over 50 venues in the United States and abroad, including the Museum of Modern Art in New York in 1992. Blocks 30, um, in 2003, Gay Block's 30-year portrait of her mother um, became a well-received traveling exhibition. It was titled Bertha Alice, Mother Exposed. Um, and it was published by Highlight Books. Um, um, in, an, an, another book was published with Drucker was um, the 2003 um, book about um, Camp Pinecliff. The topic tonight, About Love, was published last September, um, that's September 2011, and Block's photographs are in museums and private collections at the Museum of Modern Art in New York, Modern Art in New York, San Francisco, MoMA, the Museum of Fine Arts, Houston, and not least, the Jewish Museum. Daphne Merkin is a cultural critic and contributing writer to the New York Times Magazine, L and Tablet, formerly a staff writer at The New Yorker, where she wrote about film, books, and figures as varied as Sigmund Freud, Marilyn Monroe, and Kurt Cobain. Her current work continues the topics um, of high and low, or on, work on topics high and low, including, most recently, con contemporary Jewish cinema and the changing ideas of child reading. Um, she's also published a defense on antidepressants. Um, Daphne is the author of a novel titled Enchantment and a collection of essays, Dreaming of Hitler. She lives with her daughter here in New York and is at work on a memoir called Melancholy Baby. Using highly different materials, words and images, um, photographs and text, um, the, uh, both are remarkable artists whose work is searching, honest, and disarmingly personal. I welcome Daphne and Gay. Thank you. I got it. I got it. Thank you, Norman. I think it was brilliant, a brilliant idea. You all can't imagine how much fun Daphne and I have had well, I can talk louder, but let's see if I can get this closer. Um, you can't imagine how much fun Daphne and I have had 
sort of going, preparing this. So it's very nice to make a new friend, and it was a brilliant idea. Thank you very much. Um, we're not 100% sure what the format of this is going to be, but I'm going to begin a little bit. Um, and we hope you enjoyed this as much as we enjoyed all the preparation. Um, about 35 years ago, there was an article in the New York Times Magazine written by a woman who was uh, having a spiritual, uh, examining a spiritual awakening. She said that uh, a rabbi asked her, what is the opposite of pleasure? And when she answered, pain, he said, no, pain is a part of pleasure. Comfort is the opposite of pleasure. I uh, feel that that has something to do with my photography. That um, when I, before I make pictures, I usually talk to the person. And we've talked about their life. And um, they, uh, we have a, a relationship of trust that's built up. And um, well, they've talked about the pain and pleasure of their life. And they're aware that I understand that and that we've talked about what has been and might have been. And so there's nothing particularly comfortable about that. So it seems to me that the resulting images by right couldn't be terribly comfortable. Another thing I want to tell you about is um, my mother, because I began photographing her when I began photography because my first photography teacher said, go out and photograph something you need to understand. And she was the most inscrutable person in my life. Um, she had a stroke when she was 74 years old, after which she was uh, uh, more accessible and said the most introspective things that, that like she had never said before. And one day she said to me, the events that happen to us in our lifetime are what influence our days and our ways of thinking. And that has an influence on what we look like because all these things come into the picture. I'd like you to see her saying that. We're going to show a little short video now. The events that happen to us in our lifetime is what influences our days and our ways of thinking. And it has an influence on what we look like. Because all these things come into the picture. So it was um, pretty amazing to, after all those years, to have my mother acknowledge that um, she knew what I was doing. And she knew it in an amazing way. Well, the first day that I did load the f camera with film, I went to my mother's apartment. And this is the way I found her. And because my wonderful grandson is here, I'm going to go f quickly past these two pictures. This particular picture um, I did a few years later. And I did this for a reason, because, uh, and, and it was while I was, while we were in this pose that she said to me, as she had said to me a lot of times, it's too bad your breasts aren't as pretty as mine. <laughs> So that was my mother. This is my mother. My mother was multifaceted. And um, I, I, I bring those to this uh, discussion because of the relationship of Daphne's and my work in terms of being very out there with our lives. And um, my feeling about doing a book about my mother had to do with how this kind of thing, these things go on in all relationships, in all families. And uh, we need to feel a little bit more comfortable about the fact that we've lived through this. And it, it is what goes on. And I, you know, I see her here as very beautiful and vulnerable. And um, so it's, she was a whole lot of different things. 
This is an image I made in, uh, after she had died, and I'd like to read you the text. In 1982, I had my first solo museum show in Houston. As I walked into the gallery, Mother ran up to me. I expected her to say she liked my new pictures, but instead she said, how do you like my new necklace? <laughs> this became my favorite narcissistic mother story. Twelve years have passed. Mother has been dead for three years, and I have all her jewelry. This piece stands out, different from all the rest. No diamonds, no stones at all. Recalling the last time I saw this necklace, I imagine the untold story. You bought it especially for my opening and my honor. You thought it would, I would prefer it because it was designed by an artist, a gom, right? Why couldn't you tell me you did it for me? Or why couldn't I know it without your telling me? Why do you have to be dead before I begin to forgive you? So this is what that book turned out to be, is not only an examination of her, but an examination of my own culpability. This is she on her 70th birthday. And this is she after the stroke. And this is a before and after her death picture that I call What Was Mother's Is Now Mine. I live in Santa Fe, and so that's a, you know, stuck a wall in my house. As I was beginning to photograph, I photographed people, and even when my mother was not in front of my camera, she was the one I was photographing, mothers and daughters, families, and even children who I felt were comfortable in their home, in their, in their own rooms. And this picture is uh, from a series at the Jewish Community Center swimming pool in Houston. And when I saw this woman in the middle of the pool with her husband, I found out later, standing with her like that, I thought I must photograph her because it looks as if he so adores her. And I had never thought I had seen or felt a woman who was overweight look lovable. I was uh, always moderately overweight and struggled with feeling lovable. I don't think it now that it had much to do with my overweightness, but um, okay, so yep. that's, that's the last image of this section. Um, I guess one thing I'm, I'm very struck by in your work, as I've now looked at it quite a bit in these last few months, is you strike me as very receptive, curious, and not particularly judgmental. One doesn't feel, I think I meant said to you that I sometimes looking at your photographs felt my own judgment come in upon me. Um, I had a, a few sort of questions about, um, I guess, um, Gay's done a really wonderful book about her mother as was mentioned, and having written a novel myself about a difficult relationship with a, I mean, to say narcissistic is to sort of not say anything since it's the most overused word of the 21st century, but my own difficult relationship with a mother, and um, I was struck by how different these difficult relationships are. Like I could never have envisioned in a million years my mother who was German and an observant Jew, agreeing to pose for me, period, but naked, and I guess nude. And I guess I wondered what, um, about the impulse, your impulse to photograph your mother nude. It does, I, I find it an interesting, in a certain way, it seems, according to like classical Jewish tradition, I believe Noah was observed by one of his sons. My, my 
Jewish day school education is rapidly um, fading. And I never had one, so. Right, <laughs> but the son is eventually pun punished. And, um, and I don't know, even beyond the Jewish tradition, if there's a sense of violation in, in, in being in the presence of nudity of one's parent, mother, a sense of intimacy. Um, what was your impulse just in, the, in those photographs? And also, what do you think led your mother, interests me, to agree? Um, I, I assume your mother didn't walk around nude, as mine did. Right, certainly not. <laughs> And she didn't walk around nude in front of my brother, or, you know, but... Um, so she was at ease. It was completely not unusual to see her nude. Mm -hmm. So the day I went to her apartment, she said, come on in, and she was standing talking on the phone nude. And um, I stood there for a few minutes, and she didn't pay any attention, and then I took a picture, and she didn't pay any attention still. And then when she got off the phone, she sat down on the bed and started showing me some business papers. And I wasn't interested, and then I, I took a picture of her doing that, and then I took three other pictures when, uh, when she was posing. So it was just, uh, it wasn't so much an Im impulse to photograph her nude. I got there, and she was nude. Right, right. And the, but the second one, three years later, was an impulse to, huh, if she says my breasts are prettier, let's put it on black and white here. Right. In well, some ways, I think the impulse it's interesting, is partly to sort of document, but also to, I mean, I think one thing we share is a wish not to keep everything hidden under the covers or under the rug. Like families are basically pretty inviolable for all that we, you know, for all that we um, trade and gossip and innuendo, you don't really know what goes on behind the doors of most families. And I think one of your impulses to, is to sort of say, here, let's break through the door and show some of what's taking place. I think one thing I'm curious about, just I think it would interest people here, is that you said that through photographing your mother, you came to understand that she loved you, or felt that she loved you, I'm assuming in her way? N no, no, I didn't, I, it was after she died right. that I was able to see love in her right. eyes in, in a picture in which she is looking at me. Right, so it's, it's, it's situated I, in that one photograph. That's right, and I was seeking that, but I never found it, and maybe my own uh, no, it, it, every time I would feel okay with her, she would do something that was, you know, abominable again. So, <laughs> no, I, I never found it, but I really found it after she died. I worked on that book for 10 years after she died and never, you know, had never really exhibited many other pictures, and um, it worked. You know, I began to miss her after about a year. Right. And so it was like, the reason I had done all that video and, fi and photographing of her paid off. Paid off. I guess one other thought I had was when you and I were talking about why you photograph, um, and I guess also why I write, you said the, or we talked about that hostile, the hostile impulse doesn't interest you in photography to do. But then I was wondering, since I think in my own work, I feel I have maybe more of a um, hostile impulse some of the time, or an impulse to reveal the darker side of things. What happens like in the two photos of the mother, I don't know if you could go back to it. This photo and the photo before it. This particular group, to me, does not look particularly warm-hearted. <laughs> that must resonate with these people, then. <laughs> they like that. Um, and I wonder, 
Mrs. Houston, I don't think any of anybody was very warm, no. Right, but you did, would you say that you approach them with? I'm going to tell you that I photographed these people at a sisterhood luncheon. Uh, I had my camera on a tripod. There were big windows at the temple behind me, and and they were and they. I asked particularly for mothers and daughters to come up, and uh, this particular picture. I identify with the daughter on uh, your left um, because she's overweight. I identify with the pain she feels because she doesn't look like the other daughter or the mother. Especially her eyebrows. <laughs> I wondered also because you took these within the community. As I've experienced it um, in my own writing, the Jewish community is fairly self-protective, self-censoring. How did they? How did the member? How did they react? Most of these people in Houston didn't like their pictures. It's true. Um, <laughs> I went, however, um, I don't seventy. This was done in 76, maybe in 86, sometime later. Uh, and the three of them were gathered at the mother's house and to, to re-photograph. And they were particularly unsuccessful pictures, so you'll never see them. But, um, <laughs> By unsuccessful, what do you mean? I'm curious. They didn't cohere? I would never make a print that print. I liked. Right. I, I, you know, I looked at them and made prints, but uh, they, yeah, they weren't, I don't, Right. You're the word person. <laughs> I don't know. I, I also have a question about that one family group. Not th these two also look. This. This oh, seems like a, there's a big there's a story behind it because I think we discussed that the father looks on a different dimension. <laughs> he looks like the impresario of the family, and the others sort of seem to take more of a literal back seat. That's what made it a successful picture to me, and that's why I printed it, and that's why it's being shown here. Yeah. Yes. Um, it may not have appealed to some other photographer in that way, but to me, that's why I liked it. Right. And it spoke to me. Did they like this photo? Looks like they would have. I don't know. Um, I had a show in 1979 in Houston at the Cronin Gallery, and Robin Cronin was from um, Hyannis, and her mother happened to be in town. And she said, come to Hyannis and photograph. All the Jews look the same there. <laughs> so she said, she gave me phone numbers, and I was there for three weeks uh, and photographed. And I sent them pictures afterwards, but I have no idea if they liked them. Like them, right. In some ways, I guess the world out of which you emerged remains of a lot of remains of interest to you. In some way, the whole uncovering Jewishness, community, identity within a community, you sort of it, have It continued. did remain of interest yes. to, as long as it did. It yeah. Did, yeah. <clears throat> um, and I think that when you were talking about uh, getting to know families, that was why I asked such uh, in-depth questions of people uh, and liked interviewing people in families and did it a lot. Uh, mother, sons, mother, daughters, it did a lot of that. Uh, right. Did the, the husband, did, wife. Uh, did it ever feel therapeutic, the undertaking, you know, to you? To me. Uh, yes, it was, that's why the book is called About Love, because as I began to know people, uh, um, I felt great affection for them. And I would s come home and say to my then husband, so and so, you know, talked about this. I, that's really a great quality, you know. And I would feel that I had found qualities that I wanted to be. That's how I want to be. I didn't know who I was when I started photographing, even though I was 31. I, and I so. 
learning what people were like. I was doing it to help form me, to help know, right. know who I could be. Were you influenced by um, other portrait photographers, would you say? Certainly, August Sander and Diane Arbus right. were certainly my uh, more, what I would call my spiritual ancestors. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah. Shall we go to the next yes. uh, group of pictures? Yep. And so then in 1982, I went to. Uh, Okay, yes, yeah, sorry. I went to Miami for the first time uh, because I was, uh, I went with Debbie Friedman who had a concert there and I had never been to Miami. And I saw the people sitting on the porches and it, it began a, a photographic uh, journey for four years. I went back and forth to South Beach. I loved these people. I did a video about them, the video. And that's my shadow on the back of his pants. I had an argument about that. Uh, because uh, just recently someone asked me, did you take that picture because he wet his pants? And of course, I'd never thought of that. Um, but of course, I, if that had been the case, no, I would not have right. taken the picture. Right. It didn't occur to me that you... And this is what it was like in Miami. This is Tilly in 1982. Uh, two and eighty-four, or yeah, three and eighty-five, I think. And this is the, what the people were like. It was, uh, we were they sat on the porches, or they went to the beach and sang and played cards. And um, this was a, a porch, and I saw this woman smoking as I was photographing some other people. And when I turned to her, I said, uh, I, "I love the way you smoke. Can I take your picture smoking?" And she said, "Why not?" And they, you know, it's like, who cares? Why not? I really, uh, they, they, of course, it was the beautiful Deco hotels. All this uh, doesn't exist anymore um, because it's the fancy South Beach. South Beach of our time. <laughs> I think that's the last of those. Yeah. Pictures. I think this is one among my favorite of your, of your, um, photo of uh, this group is among my favorite because it seems to me that when, when you look at them, first of all, like I'm, I, we're all used to sort of old Jews in Miami being the stuff of caricature or kind of Catskills humor. Um, there's something just so unpatronizing and affectionate about these photos that I was very struck by. I was wondering, because they, the um, people seem largely unselfconscious. Was it, did you put them at ease, or did they, they don't look like they're, very few of them look like they're uncomfortable in front of the camera? I never felt they were uncomfortable, and you're right. And, um, the, um, you know, we talked a minimal amount, not, but I loved their Yiddish accents. I loved who they were. I loved their independence. Right. The fact of how they could live at this time in their lives. How they could um, walk to the corner grocery and walk to the beach and sit around and sing Yiddish songs. And I think I feel they were the Bubbies and Zadies I hadn't had. I grew up in a reform congregation in Houston. My parents were very reformed from Louisiana. And um, once when I was in a uh, carpool in high school with uh, friends from the conservative temple uh, synagogue, I think you say, um, I came home and said, oy vey, one day. And my mother said, we don't talk like that. So I loved these people. I loved them. And I kind of feel they were. I was a part of them somehow in some past life. Right. No, well, also you, you, I think you say somewhere, there's a wonderful video of these. I watched it mesmerized as this sort of competitive one-upsmanship about who moved to Israel when and why didn't you stay in Israel when you got out of the camps. And 
There's one man who's put on the defensive, but they're like, they have enormous character. Again, I was struck because I often find photos of the elderly bring out more isolation or sadness, that there was a lot of joy in these photographs. Well, that's another thing they say on the video. It, you know, it's so much better to be here. You go to concerts, you, you talk to people, you're alive here. In New York, you'd be sitting around thinking about when are you going to die. Right. And there are, the other thing that interested me that um, I was thinking, even though I grew up in an Orthodox home, I also find there's something essentially more authentically Jewish or um, accessible, accessibly Jewish. I was trying to think, was there some essence of Jewishness that can get caught on film? Um, also, what was the decision? Did you make the decision beforehand or when you got to Miami to use color? I mean, it seems to demand it. It was the first time I'd used color, and yeah. it, Miami was color to me. Yes. And so I, I didn't have a choice. It, right. felt, it felt like I had no choice. OK. OK. Um, we'll go to the next uh, series, which is Rescuers. And talk about having no choice. This, these are Christians who rescued Jews during the war. And I was, something I thought about as I was, um, as we were talking, the, the book is called Photographs and Films. And so all the films that we're referring to, the film about Miami and the film about rescuers and the film about the, the early pictures too, they're all in the back of the book in uh, two DVDs. And uh, this woman was from Poland and rescued a lot of Jews and smoked like that the whole of the interview. Uh, three hours, she lit one cigarette from another and uh, exhaled that way every time she exhaled. So in terms of photographing, there was no other way to photograph her. Uh, it, and it, to me, it uh, sort of showed who she was. She had, after the war, worked for solidarity in Poland and spent time in prison, she and her husband. And, and again, about photography, um, these two guys worked together in the Netherlands and saved a lot of people, but the guy in red with the sort of mohawk was a, a real bandito. And the other guy was uh, uh, the one who Arnold brought Jews to, and he took them into his home. He had a wife and child. And then when Arnold went back to Amsterdam to get more Jews, Sena distributed them in the, the village. And so there was no way to take this head and shoulder shot of them together because they looked so different. And as you can see, I, I had to go straight on with Arnold and sort of down with Sena. And that was completely intuitive. I, kn I know the thought did not come into my head about how the picture needed to look. And I have to show her picture every time because before we put our stuff down, she said, I feel that human beings are like pianos. We have high notes and low notes. I was just lucky that during the war I got to play my high notes. So these people did not ever say they were, they were heroes, would argue that they were not heroes. The Countess von Maltzahn said she rescued Jews because her mother was so unjust, because she had had such a long labor with her, that she always hated her, her mother hated her, Therefore, and, and, and that was, un, and so she had always fought injustice because it was so unjust that her mother hated her. There was a movie uh, play of her life uh, called The Last Jews of Berlin, and Jacqueline Bazette played her. Amazing woman in Germany that we met. These are pictures of her. This is a woman in Marseille and her when she was much younger. I found that on the wall and asked her to hold them. My friend and former curator uh, at Museum of Modern Art, Susan Kismarek, is the one who chose to show um, rescuers at MoMA. This is a woman who took many people to Le Chambon, the village in southern France. And, uh, a Polish diplomat, Jan Karski. Um, 
having read a lot of the, there's a very interesting book that comes along with the, that was done around this um, project. And I'm struck by how much the rescuers, almost to a person, insist on their own non-heroicness. There's one, someone says to you, she hates, one woman doesn't like even righteous Christians, righteous Gentiles, um, and she hates being called a hero. What struck me when looking at these photos is that there is some essential mystery about why some people choose to act, you know, in altruistic ways that most people don't. Um, do you think in some way photographs, do you think photographs of, of portraits can get at something, can get at secrets that just simply looking at a, you know, scrutiny, one-on-one -on -one scrutiny doesn't get at? Well, I'm not Sure, I think that scrutiny has, um, it's, a, it's a strange word f to me because it, the way somebody looks to you or is with you when, they, when you're talking to each other is, it seems to me, the way they feel with you. The, and, and the way I look with, and so, like you and I are intensely talking to each other, and I think that's visible. And right, I guess I was, uh, since the, the, the mystery of how these people came to be, I think one, one trait that was said they all had in common was that they didn't avert their eyes from what was going on. They were nonconformist, and right. they were, um, Malka used to call them holy busybodies. They paid attention to what was going on in the world, and they were nonconformist enough that they said, I'm not going to let this happen in, in my backyard uh, to the extent that I can. And obviously, one person, uh, 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 Alex Roslin, said he went into the Warsaw Ghetto uh, to see where his friends were that he used to do business with in the Schmata business. And he found them there, and um, he came home and said to Mela, his wife, we have to do something about this. They're dying right in front of you. And she said, what can we do? We have two children, and we don't have any money. What can we do? They were in Warsaw. And he said, well, why can't we save one? And they took in a child, and then they took in his brother, and then another brother. And the middle brother died of... Uh, a disease, but they, they saved the two brothers. So if um, many more people were able to have the insight to, as Teddy Roosevelt said, do what you can with what you have where you are. That's all we can do. We can't solve the world's problems, but we can do what we can where we are. But they were also willing to risk their lives. I mean, they were endangered by all of this. But as they said, we didn't think about that. Right. We, we didn't think about that. We, this is what we have to do. Well, what, you told me a story that just interested me about one, one of the rescuers who felt... It's this woman, I think you're probably talking about the, in Marseille, and she um, said to us during the interview, and it's in the book that's titled Rescuers, that uh, she wouldn't have done it again she, because uh, the Jews didn't really thank her and uh, that she doesn't even get a Christmas card from them. And uh, one day, a couple of years after Rescuers was published, I got a, a phone call in my studio asking for her address. And I gave this person her address. And she said she was a religious school teacher in Boulder, Colorado. That's all I knew. The next thing, nine months later, I get a package of letters from her. She explained 
that she never would read a book about Holocaust, but one rainy day she went into a bookstore and she found our book and she sat on the floor and read it and bought it and took it home and began reading at her, in her fifth grade Sunday school class once a week a story every week. The book is divided into individual stories in the rescuer's own words. And when they got to this story when read that she hadn't thanked, the children were so upset that she hadn't thanked them, uh, that, the, that, the, that the Jews hadn't thanked them. And they said, why would that happen? So the school teacher had a grandfather of one of the students come in and talk about how if you were uh, rescued, even if you were rescued by someone, you were having to remember by thinking of that rescuer a time when your life was all only victimization and terrible and terrifying and you wanted to do anything you could to forget about that life and besides that many of these people she rescued were children that she had transported to Le Chambon and the parents if they survived wanted to uh, own, take ownership back of the children. Sometimes they would have forgotten the parents. So the children decided, well, if they, if they didn't thank her, we can thank her. And they all wrote letters to her. And this young woman, uh, the teacher, translated them all into French. And she wrote them back and she said, you have rescued me. So you think about, that's another example almost of what you can do. Do what you can, where you are, right. with what you have. Have you stayed in touch with any of, the, of them? Well, uh, y yes, and m most of them are no longer with us. Yeah. Yes, Mary and Pritchard are still living in, a, in, in Washington, D.C. Um, I don't have a picture of her. Jan Karski died a few years ago. He was... Uh, in sh the film Shoah for 45 minutes and right. talked about what um, the Warsaw Ghetto was like. Strange, because he looks fairly imposing and like he could be chosen to play a Nazi. <laughs> I mean, he does have that, that was autocratic of, air. That was written in Susan Kismarek's uh, wall text. Can you really tell wh whether these people were Nazis or rescuers? I think she asked a question and didn't provide the answer. <laughs> Shall we? Yeah. Okay. Um, the next uh, series is, uh, <laughs> I had a commission to photograph ethnics in Houston. They were, it, there was a burgeoning ethnic co community. So it was a strange thing, but a, a lot of times I was walking around this town looking for people who were not Anglo. I, this is a guy in the indoor Jewish Community Center swimming pool, a Filipino nurse. And then I had another commission the same year in 1985 to photograph um, employees of a grocery store. And then I said I would do that if I could also photograph them at home. So this is the butcher in the, in the meatpacking plant. And at home with his son and still dealing with meat. And this woman said that on her, for her leisure time she liked going dancing. So I went dancing with her. And of course uh, he had his tattoos hidden. At the and then uh, in 94 when Gingrich's contract, uh, I always say contract on America, but I think it was Contract for America, um, one in the Congress. Um, uh, Malka and I thought we needed to go around and see what were people thinking. How did this happen? So this is a college professor in Boulder, Colorado. No, in Colorado Springs. This is someone in uh, Oregon. This is New Mexico. Uh, this is my friend, our friend, Paul Manette a month before he died of AIDS. And this is a picture um, not of part of any project at all um, at the Tsuki Market, which is uh, n near my house uh, in Santa Fe. And I saw this girl leaning against the car, and I rushed home, got my camera, came back, 
and she was standing there talking to her family, and I talked to her family and got permission, and was photographing her, and then I said, would you please uh, lean against the car again? When I first saw you, you were leaning against the car. And she took the exact same pose that I had seen her, and that's why the picture is like it is. Now, I used to photograph at lesbian dances and um, loved the um, <clears throat> how happy we all were to be in a place that was that felt um, it's kind of like being in Israel for all of us. Um, or what it used to feel like being in Israel. Th this title of this picture of these two women is "We've Been Together 38 Years." I know it looks like two pictures, but it is not. And so that's the end of that series. Do you want to talk um, about that or go Yeah, to just to ask, when you take photographs of, like in the photograph of the couple at the end, you could take one of the women you could at first glance think is a man. And did that strike you or that, did, that there was a certain? Um, no. No. I mean, you know. Oh, I see the break. I mean, obviously there are signifiers, as they say in graduate school, um, <laughs> that it, this is a woman with the bracelets and the ring. But there's something degendered about her to me. Yes. Well, she was really um, fairly old. I think that happens too. Um, she's. This was an '05 picture, and I think she's like 93 now. You know, so. Uh, but she's a she's she's the artist. She's in front of a painting of hers, and the other one is a cellist. Um, I think that uh, you've written Daphne about m lesbian right musings right. My <laughs> much attacked lesbian musing <laughs> was called "I'm Not Becoming a Lesbian," and it was about uh, my secret feeling that all women in the next life would try it for the, for the interest of it. Um, I wanted to ask about one other, the photo of the two black women. Is that mother-daughter? Yes, it is. Right. Because, you know, in a certain way, uh, I'm sorry, the, this is. Go ahead, the, this particular picture. Yeah, I think also the one of the, of the blonde, not her. Here she looks like this open, wild spirit, possibly partly because of the hair. But there's something about her that looks a little defiant. And then you see her here, and she looks like a much worked out Upper East Side to me. Not to say this is a unacceptable type, but I'm saying that so many of so many I looked at some other of these photos. So many of the girls seem to end up with very conventional, to use the overused word, privileged lives. You see a lot of you know, and I guess I felt. In a way, you're more accepting of that than I feel looking at it. They all just seem very much, um, you know, women, women of a certain type, with some exceptions. A few things an exception, but you don't sense much wildness or that they went on to become. It seems a lot of domesticity, a lot of jewelry. <laughs> you know, it, ha they have, it has some of that feeling to it. Do you ever feel, I guess I wondered this, do you ever feel dislike for any subject? It was the hardest photographing I've ever done. The, right. The, the 2006 pictures. And uh, I intend to, um, I didn't dislike them. I learned from all of them, uh, for sure. And 
I, I intend to go, this is my daughter and me, and that's she uh, with her kids um, in 2006. Um, I intend to go photograph them again. <coughs> what I have said is 10 years after this, so that would be 2016. I'm really getting antsy to do it. Right. But um, so I, I might go sooner. Right. Because um, even when the, the Jewish Museum, uh, the Jewish Film Festival that the Jewish Museum puts on, um, showed this film in, I think, 2007, eight, eight or nine, I'm not sure. And then when I saw some of the girls again, the women then, um, they, they had experienced things that had deepened them and um, lost divorce. And so I'm looking forward to seeing them again. Right. One of the things I think overall that I most appreciate about these photos <coughs> is that they don't seem concerned, and you said you aren't, with like formal theoretical issues as much as simple engagement, you know, photos as an art form. That doesn't seem heavily the way they are. That's what you mean by formal in terms yes, of the form. Yes, yes. I think that I, uh, I've used photography uh, for what I needed to learn. I haven't set out to, or even certainly been able to, even if I had wanted to, I think, make any kind of uh, seminal changes in the medium. I sort of use the medium of photography. Right. Just as out of curiosity, since you began over the last decades, Photography has fairly much become the ascendant cultural form. Do you have feelings about um, the prevalence, the number of, you know, the enormous amount of photography, schools, and I, I think it's I think it's great. Yeah. And, you know, I, I um, <clears throat> photography, but besides being what you just described it as. <clears throat> I'm sorry. It's changed a lot. And, right. You know, it does, most pictures on museum walls don't look anything like this. Right. Anymore. And I like that, right. too. I mean, I like both forms. Obviously, I relate more to, the, um, to this kind of pictures. But I certainly can recognize good art. Yeah. No matter what form it takes. takes. Um, okay, I think. Are, would you, are you wanting to the, put this open to questions? Yeah, I think, can you? I don't know if I'm working, but thank you so much for being with us and sharing your story. Um, <laughs> I think we have time for maybe one or two questions. Okay, I was 31, and those nude pictures of her, and she was 60. She had quite a figure, quite a body, didn't she? Certainly did. She was 60 in those first nudes, and 63 uh, in the bare-breasted pictures. I, I have an observation. Um, I'm, I was very interested to hear you say that after your, your mother had been gone for a few years and you looked at the photographs, you saw the love in her face that she had for you. And so it seems to me that you were inadvertently responsible for finding what you were seeking when your mother was alive. Because um, if you hadn't taken those photographs, you would not have come to that 
I was going to say epiphany. That's not really the right word to use. No, but you're absolutely right. And I've never been able to be a journal writer, so I don't write things down. But I do use photography as memory, as to help my, yes, that's absolutely true. One more? Thank you very much. Uh, may I just ask you, can you tell us something about your father? I, w gladly. Um, my father was a, a, a giant in the Houston Jewish community as well as the whole community. He, he was um, a philanthropist. He was a, a total giver, a total... He, he was so warm and funny and fun and loving. He was not great in terms of intimacy, you know, in terms of the right in the family. He just had a huge public. And uh, what he did, he moved to Houston. He and my mother moved to Houston in 1938, four years before I was born. And he decided right then to um, get involved in the Jewish community uh, so that he would know people. And in 1950, he and a couple of silent business partners bought controlling interest of the Houston National Bank, which then was the third largest bank in Houston. And uh, they did it for the express purpose of making it possible for Jews to get loans in Houston. It was a, a smallish Jewish community, maybe a half million people lived in Houston, and there were maybe 18,000 Jews in the 50s. Um, and. Uh, he also, when, so he was chairman of the board of this bank, and then when the loan committee refused a loan to loan somebody money, he would loan it himself. And he took, very, he was very grateful and took pride in the fact that everybody had paid it back but one. And he was president of every Jewish organization in Houston as well as the United Way. He was a, a very charismatic um, big guy and died at 66 before I started photographing. Okay, well, thank you again, Jane. It's wonderful to have you here.